Yeah, we all have Rob. Oh, where does four there? That's them just Oh, but not everybody. I um, don't no, that one was just a win. Okay. Okay. And then, um, Anna. No, that's not who you want to have. Anna, that's like intern. That's her intern, yeah. Intern, yeah. Oh, we don't want to promote anybody yet except for Rob. She said she might stay. There you go. There it is. There's Rob. And then three buttons. No, that's Rebecca. Sorry, it keeps changing because everybody right. keeps logging in. No, it's not There you go. Oh, sorry, you're right. Yeah, you have any plans? I was like, oh, okay. I'll tell you what you want to do. Monday? Monday is a token. Oh, where do you send it? Steven.fc. Yeah, it's better bag got this and proton mail and BIC. Pay no attention to the return because it's going to come from all sorts of places. Everything gets forwarded various ways and like. I think you have to have an average of oh, no. <laughs> There we go. Ah, yeah, see, now that's okay. There we go. But we don't do that until after the public comment period, yes, so or before. Do it before when you officially call the meeting to order, then you do the public comment. Got it. All right. So, since we have everybody, we have enough people here, why don't we? Yes, yes. So let's call the meeting to order. All right, chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, known as an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations, was passed by the General Court and signed into law by Acting Governor Karen Polito on July 16, 2022. That legislative action revised chapter uh, section 20 of chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and in doing so, provided modifications to the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, which allowed flexibility to hold remote only and hybrid meetings while preserving public access and, where appropriate, public participation. Currently, that additional flexibility will expire on in the new date. Okay. <laughs> At a future date, <laughs> unless additional legislative action occurs as part of this today's uh, hybrid meeting, all votes will occur via roll call. Okay. Excellent. All right. Do we have any members of the public here who would like to provide any? comment or information to the board. Seeing none, we will proceed to review of our minutes from May 10th of 2024. Any comments on the minutes? Other than a need to revise that preamble. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay. 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 Seeing none, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll uh, take a uh, take a vote. Um, you ready, Arnie? Yes. <laughs> Good. You can vote now. And That's fine. And he on in the way she's just thinking about the parking uh, or other. Yeah. Lodging situation outside. Okay, so you approve the minutes? I do. Rob? Yes. Yes. Myself, yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, St. Mary Street, housing order. Um, yes, yeah, so I could yes. get started. Um, so um this is a housing case that kind of started in in, in in um early April on St. Mary Street. Um there was um Condition of the exterior of the residence that were um, just accumulation of um, of things, including refuse, uh, rubbish, um, and bulk items, mainly like um, machinery, auto parts, that kind of thing, that were um, in the front of the, the residence, plus the sides in the, the backyard. Um, uh, I think from the town perspective, it's been going on for a long time, and then we made a decision to try to like, enforce it through the housing code. Um, so housing order was sent out um, on April 2nd after inspection was done um, and we gave them uh, 30 days to correct the the violations. We went back on, on May, after May 14th, we went back on May 21st for a reinspection observed that um, the items in the front were moved to the backyard, but there was still the same, appeared to be the same number of items and the violation had not been corrected yet. So um, we believe the next best course of action was to bring it to the board to try to um, 
enforce the orders. Um, the public health rationale for this is that it um, can harbor pests that could uh, spread disease as well as um, uh, the items that were present can uh, lead to the accumulation of water. Like there's tires back there, stuff like that, which can spread, um, can breed mosquitoes and spread disease. So um, other issues are that um, even though the, the front of the house has two egresses, the back has a, a back door as well. So in case of a fire or an emergency, there's no way to um, leave through the back of the house because of the, the amount of things back there. Um, so I think we have the occupants here. We had invited them to come. Um, and we also have uh, town council and the building commissioner as well. Um, the building commissioner came along with me for the, the inspection that was done on the 21st. Okay. And I understand that the motion needed here is just to sustain the um, order that was issued, correct? Yep. Yes, and no vote is necessary for that. Is that correct as well? Unless the board chooses to not vote for the return. Right. Very well. Discussion. I, I could also say I went back this Monday and there was some organization of things, mm -hmm. um, but the, the violation in my eyes still exists. So okay. All right. And I think the board's seen the photographs yeah. that were provided. Judge, I mean, judging from what I see in the photographs, um, there's plenty of potential mm -hmm. for rodent infestations as well as water collection and in, in the summer. We know that leads to mosquitoes all over the place. And we don't do that right now with West Island and everything that's going on. So. Okay. All right, Rob. Okay. Is there anybody here from the property? Yeah, I think yes. uh, the, the property owners and occupants are here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to speak, you're, you're welcome to. Yeah, we've got... Uh, Working quite a bit. Why don't, you have, why don't you have a seat up here and we just need you to identify yourself um, just for the Conrad record. Conrad Ardeen. Sorry? Conrad Ardeen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, the only ace I got in my hole is uh, I have a friend right now that's a professional when it comes to dealing with this stuff. And I know I noticed that picture. It really looks bad, but it doesn't look as bad now as it did the other day. And there are containers back there that I have to deal with. And uh, he's in, uh, he's on the other side of the country right now. He's coming back shortly. And we've been working diligently on this problem. And I didn't realize how much stuff there was. So we've been going at it really hard and heavy. And I really don't want to get depressed about, you know, you guys not being on my side. So I know it's been going on for a long time. But it's a full time job for me now. When is this friend coming from the other side of the country? You said shortly. What shortly? Well, he left for a week out to uh, Idaho, Idaho. Mm -hmm. and he's a professional. Mm -hmm. So he he's there every morning at what seven o'clock. You know, we got a trailer now, and we got people that want a lot of these items, and so it's working out great. I just hope my wheels don't spin spin it backwards. When's the order for correction? Um, I haven't. So the orders are correct. The time frame to correct has already passed. So um, we could set new um, time frames to correct, which I think I, we uh, I'd like the board to kind of uh, try to figure that out. The housing code suggests like a thirty day. Um, uh, these are like not imminent dangers to um, to the occupants or to public health, but like um, so you could give up to thirty days extension or whatever the board sees fit. Uh, based off like the the, the what the occupant thinks is a reasonable time frame, I would say. Can you can you comment on why it has taken so long to try to address this? Can I say something? It's because my husband's got a lot of medical issues. It's been a problem. Since I got this friend, I mean he's really helped me a lot when it comes to the mental health. You know? And he's just I never see anybody work as hard as this gentleman. I don't know if you have actually seen pictures of what we did at one point where the leaves had been there for so long that the dirt was this thick over my asphalt. It took days and they wanted to bring in a, a, a backhoe to get it out of there, but we dealt with it. But anyway, those are just little things that were very, very time consuming. And I know these pictures are, look really bad and I can't agree with you more. I, th I think that my opinion is that, well, given you know, your 
progress to date and, and what you've based on what you've said uh, and make, you're making a good faith effort that we could extend a month, maybe six weeks, as long as it is getting corrected, getting better. I'd appreciate that more than you'll ever know. Tara? I was just going to mention to the board, just so you had some information on the background of this property. So back in 2019, um, Diana Acosta, previous health agent, and I worked with Conrad and and we did very good work. We met with Conrad, I think it was weekly during that summer, right? Yeah, that was good. COVID hit and um, the items were removed and the, it looked really well, you know, it looked like a, it complied. So no orders were issued at that time. But then when the pandemic hit, it seemed like during that time frame that things might have gotten put back on the property. Yeah, I had some issues back then. I'll admit. So that's kind of when this ramped up again and the neighbor started calling on the other side because the initial complaint came in from the neighbor that was trying to sell on the right side, I believe, of the house, right? And then they they were able, and, but then the neighbor on the left side started complaining uh, and that's why we have been involved with it since then. But, so it's been one of these things that have been ebbing and flowing. We've got it in a good place and then it would go back a little bit and then now it's you know going back the other way. So I just want to let you know. The history that's going to stop. Right. Any other discussion? Can I just ask how long does the occupant think it would take to um, come into compliance? You know, if we were to offer uh, an extension, as Ed suggested, uh, does the occupant think that would be a reasonable amount of time, or realistically, would it be longer? Well, it's very helpful that my wife is on my case about this because it is embarrassing, especially when you look at those pictures. And I think I can do a, I, I, I'm kind of hoping it'll all be good. In other words, you won't be able to pick on me about anything in six weeks. It's a, I, I'm going to have to pay this gentleman at this point. I'm going to have to go get an uh, all equity loan because I got to keep paying her because up to this point, we've been swapping neighbors. That's going to get old. But he is one of the hottest workers I've ever done. So I can't wait for him to come back. <laughs> okay. Okay. You want to make that as, as, uh, you want to make a, motion? as a motion? Okay, well, I'll make a motion that, given a good faith effort on the part of Conrad, uh, that <clears throat> we extend the grace time, I guess you'd call it, uh, from, uh, let's say, six weeks. Okay, six weeks from today. Progress happening some along the way. Yeah, let's make that contingent on continued progress. Yeah. Okay. Is it going to be Joseph that's going to be coming by? Or? Perhaps myself inside. Yeah. All right. No, I got no problem with that. I mean, if they see okay. something that they feel I should be putting more energy toward, fine. Okay. Yeah, we can get a progress report at our uh, meeting on July 12th. Yeah. We need a motion. We need a second on that motion. Yeah, I second it. It's okay. Okay. I suppose we need a vote since we have a motion on the floor. Okay. <laughs> uh, Rob? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, yes. Hold on. Oop, sorry. Um, uh, just uh, we would ask that the, uh, possibly the condition be that we, that Cy and I be allowed to access the property and walk the property with uh, the property. Is that okay, Conrad? Yeah. Okay. So without objection. All right. Yes. If I don't pay myself, yes. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be done. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the call. Okay. Thank you. Let's get back Thank to you. our agenda. All right. Um. Input on the select local polls. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're glad they're taking it seriously. I think um, what has been, as Tara alluded to, uh, a couple environmental health agents ago that we've been working with them on yes. this. Um, and I, so they, that. Okay. I think the hope is partially that this also underscores for them how serious it is. Right. So that's why I wanted the interim check in because otherwise I feel like. Nothing may happen for six weeks. Yeah. And we, I mean, Cy will probably include a brief update about it. We have other places in town where pests are an issue and we really can't be having 
harbor jump, things like that. Yeah. Yep. The select board has asked for um, the town's boards and commissions to provide input on its uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's sort of two ways to look at it, and we can sort of do both. One is sort of very aspirational, high level. Is there something long term the Board of Health wants to see? And more short term, if the board wants to make a case for, you know, and we've, we've already done this, but say if the board said, we really need to have an epidemiologist in the department, we need data analysis in our department, we need that support. Well, we would suggest the select board that there needs to be a goal related to the town, you know, using data driven decision making or something. And that would help when we went to do a budget application, we'd say, you know, not only does this reflect the Board of Health goal, this also reflects a select board goal. <laughs> Um, so, so, so two ways to think about it. One is general high level thinking and policy and one is more immediate. We want to, in the next year or two or three, write a budget, uh, request for some function. And this would be a great way to do it. Okay. Obviously we already got the FE and we got the nurse. We made all the art positions permanent. So we had sort of laid the breadcrumbs for those, but this is kind of one of the options to do it. The board of health says it's a really big priority to have senior nutrition or uh increased physical activity just physical activity um yeah because i mean i was looking through this and goal 1.2 supports the physical and mental well-being of its community members April. but when you look at the initiatives no, there is no initiative tied to that yes and i would like to see initiatives tied to each one of those goals yeah. and currently they do not do that not yeah not at all yeah and those should align with what the health department's working yeah, I, I can see reading through them. I feel like each of yeah. these goals actually have one or two specific items as to what this would mean or what are the two different categories that they want to work with. I think that would help us gain guidance as to where we want to focus our resources on. Right. So it would be really good to have some more specific goals, um, especially the, the first part. Yeah. One of the things we were thinking is, you know, the the team specifically public health nursing team has been making a big push on the heart safe community, uh, which relates a lot to um, CPR uh, training, ADD treatment, ADD training and ADD access. Um, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 10% of the population um, trained on CPR and AED use. Yeah, it's training. something like that, 10, 10 to 15, yeah, something yeah. 15. Um, and it's not full CPR either. So we've been holding classes at like the library that people can come practice the skills and we just kind of teach them. Um, so it's mostly education, but um, I'm sorry, I was asking if they were connected with elder services. So I missed what you guys were talking about. That's right, we just started on the goals. Oh, oh. And so I was, we were talking about how- Connected with physical. Right, Steve said, you know, physical well being is one of the select board goals, but there are no initiatives or actions that are Tie back to that goal. Um, yeah. So I was saying you had suggested heart safe community. Yeah. One yeah. So they could support that process between oh, the speakers not working again. Mm -hmm. we'll put it across the pope. And now it is. Can you hear us now, Ed or Rob? Sorry. I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, um, now I can see you. The owl is being weird. <laughs> um. Yeah, they could help support in that process because this is a connection between both us and the fire department as well. So um, that could be something if you want to suggest that to them. I think, yeah, you know, for example, under that first goal, where it says support physical and, men and mental well-being, et cetera, um, we could put a reference in there to um, supporting the goal, the public health department's goals. You know, supporting yeah. public health department's goals. As such as, and then heart health. Do we have time to give feedback on these, or at least like having some goals from from Department of Health or Board of Health, and kind of see how they? Yep. So uh, um, we have provided the town manager's office with the strategic plan and the community health improvement plan. Um, they asked for feedback from boards uh, by the twenty first of next Friday. Uh, if they follow the same trajectory they did last year, they do invite um, a couple of sort of senior department managers to sit in on the first half of their goal setting session. 
um, and sort of to bring the views of their board or commission to the table. Um, so if they do that, then we can not only respond in writing, but I can have a couple of key points that I can emphasize. Well, I appreciate they have a goal seven environmentally sustainable. Um, that really is under goal three livable. That it ain't livable if it ain't environmentally sustainable. I mean, I appreciate they broke it out because they wanted to give it more prominence, probably. Yeah. Um, but those two go hand in hand. And I think again, I don't see how you know their initiatives go hand in hand with there. You know, I mean, for livable, it's all about okay, we need to basically have you know services and facilities, but there's nothing there about environmental sustainability. Rob, um, I just wanted to add that uh, under their goals, number four, which is being accessible and connected, reliable, clean mobility options, prioritize bicycle and pedestrian safety promoting transport options to remain an age-friendly community, and goal number five, being safe. In the first <laughs> zero to 18 months, they only list one thing for those two goals. That's under goal number four, and that's just to sort of um, right. increase um, parking uh, payment options um, to make it more sort of app or credit card accessible. And I just... I'd like to see them have more goals in the first zero to 18 months related to those two, um, two of their own stated goals. And also I just wanted to provide them the feedback that with the parking meters to it remain age friendly, they need to make sure that the cash option with quarters is still an option. Cause I think mm -hmm. it's harder for older citizens to use the apps and the credit cards to pay for parking. I was late because I couldn't get the charging thing to work with my credit card. So, uh, and hopefully I'm not, you know, uh, hopefully I'm reasonably adept and I couldn't do it. So I agree, <laughs> with, uh, I agree with you completely. I think the other thing you might want to talk to Colin and share with him, because I think under, uh, again, goal number one, yeah. uh, you, you might be able to fit the comments that were made last night at the Council on Aging meeting, the yeah, fitness room and uh, so on. Yeah, and, uh, um, under that. So they do have um, under, you know, and I, I don't know why it's necessarily responsibly governed, but in the near term, responsibly governed, they had capital facilities and they had cath upgrades, including additional parking and library phase renovations. Uh, I did talk to Colleen yesterday morning before the meeting. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, she did say uh, that. I do think I need to get a little bit more information from from them. Um, the the cap renovations are on the capital improvement plan. I know they are, but, but like five years. Out. Well, design money in twenty six, construction money in twenty seven for the first part, but then yeah. yeah, three more after that, and then three more after that to finish it um, is a long time. So Tim, the question I have is, I mean, yeah, the healthy and socially thriving is is pretty light on substance, and is that intentional <laughs> because they expect that to really be the function of you know, this board, and so that's why they don't go deeper, or, I mean, which is, or is it that we should say specifically they should be supporting what this group is doing to help tighten that connection? So, um, I don't know, or I think they will tell you they're always supportive of the boards, but I, I think it's only really tangible if we get them to say, yes, senior nutrition is, is a priority. Yes, um, you know, transportation options for uh, people of all ages is, is a priority. Um, I don't know why uh, it, the only reason I can think that maybe it was a little bit different last year is the time frame they gave was a lot more compressed for feedback. So maybe there was less feedback. Um, I don't know why they, you know, they, they had some areas where there were quite a lot of um, initiatives and there were some that had very, very few initiatives. So I'm not sure exactly why that, why that sort of shook out that way. Yeah, I mean, looking at like goal four, you know, offer and encourage a variety of safe, comfortable, affordable, whatever, additional mobility options. I don't know if the one right underneath that applies complete street principles. I'm not sure what those are. Uh, that might be a tactic that's, you know, it really belongs in the zero to 18 months. But if you really want to do that, it's like, okay, that means we're looking at bicycle racks downtown, for instance, right? We're looking at additional charge points, you know, for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that anywhere in terms of their tactics, you know, their initiatives. 
Do they need to be in there? Yep. Okay. So I think the feedback is, you know, one, you know, for that first one, we should get in, you know, basically they support our goals. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and second, they need to really put a lot more um, specific initiatives to address each one of the points that they brought up. And then we'd like to see it again. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we will, but, it, <laughs> but they're asking for our feedback. They are. And that, there's the feedback. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> They're light on specifics, and we'd like to see it after they have the specifics. Okay. That's fair. Any other comments on uh, select board goals? Just a couple points along yes. the same lines. Where do the specifics like nutrition for kids in, in schools, for example, or some of our uh, fields, uh, you know, within the area or even the transportation aspect? For not just the elderly, but also just in general to reduce pollution to be sustainable uh, within them. Do those fit in any of these goals? Because again, I didn't see any of those, like dog parks, for example. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it's an open question. My understanding was they wanted them to be broad and all encompassing. Yeah. Presumably, you know, issues related to school transportation for kids would fall under the school committee. But if the select board thinks it's a priority, it should also be. Yeah. included in their sort of umbrella goals. Um, I can ask, you know, sort of where those things are, or did they say, well, the school committee will tell us and then we'll populate it with their ideas. Yeah, is that very broad? <laughs> They're very broad, yes. Thank you. I did find it helpful to have the sort of time frames, though, at least, that they were going to try to make progress on this within a year and a half yeah. versus okay. within three years. Awesome. Um, well, I do up. think one of the things that, and it's been taking a long time because it's a little fee, but the MBTA expanded parking at the senior center. So the town is going to rent, sort of permanently rent, um, 13 additional spots from the MBTA. Yeah, 13. 13. Um, they're going to restrike three of them to make two handicap instead of three regular. And then they're going to, so they'll have two new handicap spots and 10 regular spots close to the building. To be helpful. Yes. I think, isn't it sort of generally true that goals are pretty generic and then you get into the action items? Yep. And that's sort of the way they set this up. Uh, so it would seem to me that maybe we're, if we're looking for specific actions, they should be targeted to them. Yeah, I, I do think they're looking for feedback on both. They're looking on feedback on the goals, which mm -hmm. is a very high level, and then they're looking on feedback for. And what does this mean? Yeah. What does what do we actually do? So I think if we added that comment about supporting the health department goals, yep. uh, or counts on aging goals, whatever the case may be, uh, and then at specific spots in the action items, yep. maybe say specific thing. Okay, great. Okay. Other comments on the select board goals? Okay. Seeing none, and given that we have Cheryl Spar here, why don't you come on up, Cheryl? Let's start talking about synthetic marijuana and freedom regulation. Morning. Okay. All right, so at, at our last meeting, we were going to get a little bit more information on <clears throat> Kratom part of this. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. yeah. Right. So we're, yes, yeah, Cheryl has briefly <laughs> joined us today to answer any questions that you might have on the old regulation versus a new regulation that Cheryl helped us draft. So we're grateful for that. So yeah, so um, we did have that question from Rob about maybe not keeping that addendum A um, out of the regulation, Exhibit A, um, but you had a good the list of explanation. Yeah, yeah um, all of you know that I've been dealing with the tobacco industry for a hundred years now, um, <laughs> and they play a game called whack-a-mole, 
with us. And whenever we adopt a regulation, they attempt to find a loophole and create a product that um, was not covered in the regulation. And that's the same thing, you know, in, in looking at exhibit A, um, I'm sure when this exhibit was drafted, it was accurate, but I'm also certain that it is not accurate anymore. Um, and, and in order to avoid that, <clears throat> one of the strategies is to not try to create a list because when you try to create a list, mm -hmm unless you have full-time staff working um, every day, Googling and doing lit searches, you're gonna miss some of the new products that are coming down the pike. Um, so we that's why we don't anymore try. And, and people have been trying, MAHB, my agency actually tried to create a list of flavored tobacco products about 15 years ago or maybe 10 years ago. And we couldn't possibly keep up with the new products that were coming out on the market. So um, we had personal experience with the challenges that um, actually produced. And we were, um, the Yarmouth Board of Health actually was sued by Cumberland Farms because they were selling a product that was not on our list. And they use that as one of their grounds to sue Yarmouth. Um, we won eventually, um, but we don't, We it was a lesson learned that creating a list is um, right now foolhardy. I mean, California is trying to do it um, either with hemp derived products or flavored tobacco products. And even with their vast resources, they're not able to keep up. We've so, seen that. They just keep exactly. that it, it's, stuff yeah. all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look now with the intoxicating products that we're talking about, um, we've got Delta 8, Delta 10, THCO, Delta 236. I mean, it, it just, the um, synthetic products that are being created in these labs that aren't certified or regulated at all, um, it, it, it's like alphabet soup. You right. just can't, you can't keep up with it. Oh, all they have to do is take a, a hydrogen off one place and stick it someplace else. And yeah. think of it, it's a new compound. So. Yeah. Maybe you could, if, um, instead of having, say, exhibit A and, and this be the, the total list, make it such as found in exhibit A, but not, does not. Or included, but not limited yeah, to. Right, yeah, right. Could add yeah. that. Um, I'm not sure, and Tara, maybe you or Tim, I'm not sure what these products are here. Yeah, they're so on updated. exhibit A. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like K2. I know what K2 is. Yeah. Um, okay. But I don't, some of these look like they might be flavored tobacco products. They are. Yeah. They are. So, okay. Um, so, and, yeah, because our previous regulation not only dealt with synthetic cannabinoids, but also with a whole bunch of stimulants. Okay. Um, which this current one does not seem to do with psychedelics, a um, whole, whole bunch of other controlled substances that this new regulation doesn't. So, I mean, that's going to be part of my question is like, okay, are we mm -hmm. dropping regulations on all of these other products and why? Mm -hmm. uh, it might be covered someplace else, um, you know, under state law. Um, state law tried to list them all out too at, at one point. I don't know if any of you are aware, but the Joint Committee on <clears throat> Cannabis and Agriculture held a hearing this past Tuesday on these products. MHB was the first panel that testified um, on these. And, and <clears throat> one thing to remember is that if if a if a product is on the Controlled Substance Act list, either the federal or the Massachusetts one, it's illegal to sell that product, regardless of what the industry claims. If it's listed as a controlled substance on Massachusetts list, which is derived from the federal government's list, you don't need a new regulation to 
address it. It's it's illegal. The question becomes who does the enforcement on that product? And the law enforcement um, who I think, and I testified to this, that we need to bring in to this um, discussion in some way, shape or form, um, they're not the ones that are enforced. We now have the Department of Public Health and MDAR, the Department of Agricultural Resources, and the ABCC, and the Cannabis Control Commission working together to try to find a solution to why to, to, to clamping down on the industry that are selling these intoxicating products. Um, but we're still left with boards of health being in the position where they can use the food code if the products are edible. However, they can't use the food code or at least the, the permitting enforcement authority of the food code to get at products that are shelf stable. So in all of these products, virtually all of these products are shelf stable. Think Skittles, Twinkies, Coke, they're all shelf stable. So in, in, in the food code exempt shelf stable food from enforcement, except you could maybe embargo or use the nuisance statute to issue an order to cease and desist. But that's tough to do. And, and the general consensus at that hearing was that what the Cannabis Control Commission testified to and what DPH testified to is that we need to set up an independent laboratory <laughs> that can actually um, study these products and regulate these products, much like the Cannabis Control Commission does with the 14 independent labs that um, test Delta 9 cannabis products. Um, that seemed to be the general consensus. Um, cannabis Control Commission has tested some of these products and found contaminants and chemicals that they don't even know what they are some solvents that they can't identify in some of these products. Um, so that look, looks like where the state will be heading, but you know as well as I do how long it takes them um, to enact new legislation. So, you know, I, I, I'm happy to consider putting in, including but not limited to, um, or, you know, a, a and some other sort of exhibit A dealing, looking at what we currently see, if that's something that the board wants to entertain. I, mean, I don't feel strongly about a list because to your point, I just feel like as soon as you put it out there, it's inaccurate. It's 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 outdated. Exactly. No, so in that. some ways it keeps it more open if you don't even I mean, we did specify in, in this regulation and, and some boards are looking at that, is putting freedom in as another one I, I i don't the science isn't isn't conclusive on kratom some people do claim that it helps with um withdrawal from heroin addiction but it's again not regulated at all so but that science is just evolving in academics right now. They are trying to understand what is what are the normal levels of alcoholics that are present in Kratom that kind of have that risk to benefit for anxiety agents versus having some of the hypertensive issues that are associated with prolonged Kratom use. Yes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's that's coming very soon from the University of Florida. Some of the researchers there are working on it. So they have a couple of uh, symposia that came on with FDA as well. Because they are seeing this coming in the markets, yes, more and more, and they are really working towards putting some regulations there. That's right. Great. News, yeah, yeah. I mean, our questions regarding that, where FDA has has been kind of active in this area, along with NIH, um, to the point where they they're actually, I mean, they're actively studying it, now. Yeah. right? Where before it was just you know outright, you know, nah, you know, now it's like, well, wait a minute, there may be something here. Yeah. 
We have conducted a couple of clinical trials, phase one studies to assess the levels and safety and tolerability as well. Though and data will come out soon. Yeah, there's an active kratom industry that are, yeah. <laughs> um, they've test they've come to some local, I think it was in Belchertown. They came in person to the Board of Health meeting um when the board was so considering. you didn't get away with saying Kratom and all derivatives thereof or anything like that, right? We we can. But would you end up being challenged in court over that? But Cheryl finds that fun. So. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we do have a call at 12 with KP Law hey, on have. another challenge. We, we, we were challenged by RJ before. I've oh, heard I that as a badge of honor. <laughs> I know. I did. So. We just beat RJR in, in Chelsea, and I'm sure you saw the new guidance document that came out from the Department of Public Health. We only waited for two years for it, but it did it did finally come out claiming that Newport non menthol was in fact a flavored yeah. product. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so where does this leave us today? I guess that's the question. You know, I mean I'm I'm gonna throw out sort of as a as a straw man, strong person, I don't know what, how you say that these days, um, that we go, you know, we could go, first off, I think we have a hearing already on the books, right? For July. We can always cancel or change it, but we do, mm -hmm. we did pay to advertise it in the next couple of weeks mm -hmm. under the thought that the board would want to hold a public hearing that day. Right. Um, because one, I mean, we could have like a plan B, if you will, which is basically this reg minus kratom. Oh, okay. Right, because then we have yeah. we have all the marijuana derivatives, which has been the issue with the CBD store yeah. and the like, right? So then we're on pretty firm ground there, mm -hmm. um, and continue to monitor kratom, and we can see what the you know what the town wants to do at the hearing, you know, for kratom. So we have mm -hmm. kind of a, an A plan and a B plan. You want it, yeah. you don't want it. Sure. I don't know if it's going to come out that fast. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, these are, these are like year long studies, years yeah. long studies. I mean, we, we could collect some of the information that is being published right now through white papers, through some of the collaborators, and we could review those together um, because those are the folks who are working with the FDA as well, so that we are in sync with the, some of the breakthrough data that will come out in a month or so. If you think that's useful. Well, I think maybe it's a good idea to proceed on this and leave Kratom sort of in a dark area and then say, okay, now we'll amend it again and add Kratom. It like will that. be interesting to see if we wait on, if you want to wait on Kratom by the time Kratom is researched sufficiently, there's going to be another substance. Oh, it, yeah, that's the that's one. True. Yeah, you can't predict that, but this at least, I mean, this is you know plant based, pretty well known. And this, and this is what we are currently dealing yeah. with in Massachusetts and everywhere. These yeah. are the products that, um, someone, one of the press reported it as gas station weed. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there you go. Yeah, I could say I'm not seeing it here in Nita. I used to work in Belchertown. I would see it oh. quite frequently over there and mm -hmm. a lot of the towns in Western Mass. So, but I haven't seen it here in the gas stations or the retail stores here, um, like the Kratom products. Yeah, we see yeah. the effects of this in the emergency mm -hmm. department. But again, yeah. I don't know based on what's going on you know, at the federal level, whether or not we have enough to ban it, you know, ban the sale of it here in the town. As people can rightly say, you know, hey, the data is still inconclusive. So under what under what basis are you saying that this is, you know, harm, you know, do we have enough to say that it's harmful? Mm -hmm. and I think when we were thinking, and this is just a general comment, when we think about sort of the the regulatory structure, oftentimes if we're if we're thinking in the medicine or therapeutic area, you have to prove something is safe, not prove something is unsafe, right? Mm -hmm. Since where is the proof and proof there in that kind of equation? I, I would probably need to including it, but I think it's something we should think about. And, you know, the board is always pretty deliberate about holding one or two months of discussion, reviewing a lot of material, then holding the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we have the ability to move quicker in the future if the board wants to do something fairly simple like add Kratom in or take Kratom out. Mm -hmm. We can move more quickly than we normally do when we're considering sort of something brand new. Um, so the board could choose to keep it in and then quickly take it out if it needs to, or not include it and then quickly add it in when we have the data. data having already studied it, but yeah. And and I would just point out, and I'm sure you know that um, the state law on flavored tobacco products requires <laughs> that the manufacturer submit a letter attesting under the pains and penalties of perjury that each product that they are um, having distributed to convenience stores or to any retail tobacco store, they attest that it is not flavored and the letters are just not true. We put the burden thinking that that would help on the industry and the industry just says Newport no menthol is not flavored. Mm -hmm. I attest to it. What's happening with Kratom in other towns? That you've been working the only with? town I know not right now that is specifically um, Bandit is Belcher Town. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, a lot of towns and cities are talking about it mm -hmm. um, very actively, whether they want to consider banning it or not. Okay. And then none of them are talking about regulating it; they're talking about banning it. Well, you need to make a good point about like you know proving it, it's effective. But, uh, uh, should be the first step before you know before you allow it as opposed to you know trying to prove that it's unsafe. But so I mean you know with that I'd you know I'd be open to considering well if the evidence comes in that it's safe then fine we'll I mean safe and effective we would amend potentially but given the uncertainty maybe you know we would err more on from a safety standpoint until we know we don't want this stuff out there. Okay. We'll see I mean, we, like we, we do that in public health all the time, yeah. right? Exactly. So what data have we found in the past month on this stuff? I know Newton has, we've seen it at a store there that they're offering. I mean, it's coming closer. And I think, no, 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 yeah. it's, it's oh, coming closer. Oh, yeah. What have we done? It's, it's in Melrose. We're doing, that, we're doing the science behind it. Just, you know, like I said, the studies are still coming out. So we're mm -hmm. just keeping our eyes, our ears and open, you know, to re researching that, but have you gotten anything new? I haven't started researching yeah. um, that topic yet. Yeah. But, yeah. It, it was, sounds like that'll be our first step. Yeah, that's right. right. Other discussion? No. Just for awareness, I feel I mean, this is something I've done just uh, trying to learn here, but I feel somewhere it would be good to have public awareness of these lists as well. Because I think often when we go through circumstances like the, the Sunmet store, I think people do not have all the knowledge from the state level or from the town level as to which of these substances are allowed. And, and, and it just becomes a very general discussion rather than an informed decision coming out of the board. So I think it would be very good for public to be aware that these are the things that are not allowed by the state of Massachusetts and, and by the town. Because often these discussions just kind of go out of control as well. Yeah, and, and that's a really valid point. And that was brought up at the oversight hearing as well, in that the Senate senators and reps were asking the Department of Public Health and MDAR, what are you doing to educate um, both retailers and the public about um, these products and the fact that they are illegal. So the guidance document, the joint guidance document put out by DPH and MDAR is helpful. It went to all retailers. Um, and the guidance from the ABCC, the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, went out to all liquor licensees. Um, but there needs to be a lot more work done. I mean, some of the retailers have no idea. And they're told by distributors that they're legal, which you know, which makes it even more difficult. So there has to be a really broad educational outreach and, and campaign. Karen, so you can correct me. One of our one of the CBD issues, um, one of the convenience stores came to us and said, Hey, my distributor says I can sell this. Can right. I? Yeah. And so that is right. That them them doing, I think, exactly what we want them to do is is asking the question when they think something is dicey. Mm -hmm. 
but we have to be proactive in, in, in yeah and, and make follow up on that guidance document which went out the end of may is yep. going to really be helpful yeah. to go to the retailers yeah. that are selling the stuff um I hope I was writing an ICF in layman's language <laughs> because sometimes people just don't want to read all the details of right. the scientific aspects. So. Yep. so action items for our next meeting will be, we're going to be having a hearing. We're internally going to gather um, the scientific data to be shared with the board at least a week prior to that meeting so that we can review it. We'll get additional, I imagine that the industry folks will be sending us a lot of stuff and we should ask them to send like, you know, the actual scientific stuff, yep. uh, not the propaganda. We've seen that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we want this, we want the studies behind it. Yep. Um, you know, and then we'll have a hearing. We'll gather more information. We don't need to make a decision at that hearing. That's really more of an informational uh, type of gathering. Okay. And then um, following that, either in August or September, we can come to a vote. Would you want a public comment period to open at that hearing and then extend for a week or two? For yes, no, good idea. Yes. All right. Anything else on this? All good. Good. Yes, that's all right. Point. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank Thank Carol. I really, really liked the summary that uh, Commonwealth had. Lawmakers stressed the urgency of dealing with the issue of intoxicating hemp based products, but said they're unlikely to do anything before the next legislative session next year. This is, I, I was so, and, and I was on vacation actually when I testified at that hearing. And yeah, they said it was clear that this is a problem. It's a real problem and it's completely unregulated right now. And the only ones doing anything are health departments, local health departments. And they ended with, this is really serious. But the session is almost over, so we'll deal with it next yeah. in two years. Yes. In two years, they're gonna deal with that because it takes two Cycle. years. Yeah. 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 It was um frustrating to say the least. Okay. I mean, we 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 asked, well, we didn't ask for, but the ask we were going to make is that there should be an emergency order from the governor, like Baker did for Evaldi. There yeah. should be an emergency order or just maybe even just from the commissioner of public health. But he didn't even know the difference between Delta 8 and Delta 9 when he testified. So. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's concerning. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Right. Thank you. They can't know that. Thank you for all you do. No, they can't, but they should. They should be prepped for those sorts of things. Okay. Um, Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Anytime. Bye-bye. And let's move on to staff reports. Um, I like to group these okay. a little bit. So, you know, the substance use prevention stuff comes together. Nursing and epidemiology should probably come together. Shared services and accreditation, both being administrative, should probably come together. Okay. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, jump around a little bit. Um, but otherwise, we're kind of, you know, playing ping pong. Um, so we have nursing starting. So why don't we do that and then epidemiology? Then we'll do all the substance abuse stuff, at least to start. Okay. Um, so the better balance class at North Hill ended. We had five graduates. Um, we also had our Mother's Day diaper drive that went successfully. We had over 2,900 diapers donated through Amazon and they're still taking donations. So the link is still on our social media um, um, accounts as well. And then unfortunately we did have strep and a GI bug going around at one of our daycares, but um, a little challenging to manage because I gave them as much information as I would, you know, like testing them, sending them back home, not having them come back if they had a fever. Um, so I did have to call MTPs just to back me up a little bit, but they seem status quo right now. I haven't gotten any new cases of students or teachers in the last few weeks. So I'm hoping that's, it keeps up, but otherwise, those are my major updates. If you guys have any questions, good questions. No, no. I'm sure I'm um, deep with the great baron. <clears throat> oh, Hannah to do it well. Um, she did say like there were some lessons learned. I don't know specifically because she's been sick, so I didn't get a chance to catch up with her, but it went well and. I think she also brought Narcan, if I remember, but I don't know if she distributed any as well. So. And then the farmer's market is starting as well. I'm not sure there would be an opportunity to have a presence there occasionally with similar 
I know heart saved her. Okay. I'm sure it's up for sleep. <laughs> Epidemiology too. All right. Um, I just, you know, as we're in our COVID decline, I just wanted to include sort of the the summary from sort of this the start of maybe a little before sort of respiratory virus season, um, going from last August until now. Um, just because we're really like kind of getting locked into this sort of solid pattern of. Um, you know, we're hitting our peak in December, January, and, you know, this is not surprising. Um, you start to see a decrease in the cases, but then I think um, something that people sort of forget is that really the, the increase in cases kind of starts back up in July, working our way all the way back up to um, December and January. And so I think that there's sort of this very limited time period of time now where like people, you know, can quote unquote forget about COVID. Uh, but even into the summer, the cases are starting to increase again. And I just included, you know, Massachusetts um, has a, a dashboard that kind of shows the patterns over time for all of the, the acute respiratory disease uh, hospital admissions <clears throat> that goes back to 2020. And like, we're just pretty locked into this cyclical pattern now, again, of that peak in, in December, January, a decrease kind of through May, June, and then we start increasing back in July again. <clears throat> Um, uh, otherwise, fire safety committee, um, the fire safety permit cycle, we just kind of went through, um, I think Cy and I are going to work on really solidifying the timeline for that next time, first time around. Um, I think it went well, but I think we just need to really make sure we've locked in all of our, our deadlines, um, for the upcoming year, but all of the applicants have been really, um, pleasant to work with and cooperative and understanding of the process, which has been great. Um, we just got um, our Metro West Adolescent Health Survey data, which I'm very excited about. Um, so that's from the 2023 administration um, of the survey. And uh, I'll be working with an intern over the summer to um, look at that data, analyze it, work with Karen Shannon on the substance use data and get some presentations together for span quarterly meetings, select board and the board of health. Um, so we're going to try to identify um, some of the, the notable points that have come from the 2021, especially 2021 to 2023 survey administrations and try, I would anticipate um, in the fall, maybe that presentation. Um, one other sort of thing that I wasn't able to include here, but I did want to mention, and it was brought to my attention by Karen Shannon, was um, a dashboard that she found from the environmental working group that she was highlighting um, PFAS levels. I don't know when the last conversation, I'm not sure that since I've been here, there's been a conversation really about the EFOS, um, but the EPA recently released standards for PFOS levels that really, really took them down low because they determined, you know, there are no safe levels of PFOS. Massachusetts, historically, as I understand it, has had a lower standard than the EPA, yes. but that has changed. Um, so Massachusetts is working, as I understand it, on updating their guidance. But um, I found in sort of this interactive map that Karen showed me that, like, currently the water system in Needham, the MWRA, does have higher levels than this new EPA standard of sort of two of the notable PFOS. Um, and systems have, I think, five years to comply with this and, and fix their systems. And you know, Tim, maybe you, maybe you know more about this than I do, um, and comply. But I just, you know, I wanted to, I think, bring it up to see when the last conversation that we had about PFAS was, and if this is a topic of interest to discuss more at a future meeting. Um, again, I found this after I put together my report, but I can put together something more for next meeting, um, or I can look for something specific or, Perhaps we're not ready to discuss it yet, but I wanted to just bring it up. It's a good topic of discussion. I think it is too, yeah. because people are becoming more and more aware of it. You can start hearing things, yeah, yeah, you know, in the general conversations about PFAS. Yeah. And what do you know about PFAS? And at least I know it means. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think we should deal with that. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, we we basically took a biosafety program that was more of a and we really re and reinvigorated it and, uh, you know, begun to 
create a really viable program out of it. And uh, all, uh, you've done a great job dealing with the existing biotech companies in town. So I think it's, it's, it's worked out very well. Yeah, I think so. So for the PFOS, maybe we have a discussion. Um, just again, they give us something to discuss. Um, I'm thinking a public education pamphlet might be helpful in this regard. You know, yeah. what to do with your cookware. Yeah. Should I be worried about my water? What about, you know, other products in my house? <laughs> These are the questions people have. And if we could develop those FAQs into some sort of brochure, um, you know, that might give us at least an early discussion point. Great. And I think the water issues are a question people will have. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say is we probably should connect with the water department, too, to see yeah, what absolutely. their plans yeah. will yeah. be as well. Yeah. Especially with Make the new... Big FAQ. The new levels, yeah. federal level. Yes. Yeah. Now all of a sudden we're, we've got a problem where we didn't before. Mm -hmm. People are going to pick that up. Yes, that's right. Karen found it, and again, as a resident and staff member, was like, "What? What am I doing?" And you know, after he's seeing that, I'm like, "Oh, you, you." I'm assuming a trickle will come in of people who are discovering this. Eventually, it will be picked up. I'm assuming it will be discussed in news articles, and things like yeah. that. <laughs> Looking so. behind you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So I think it's good to be proactive and and Karen, that's a, that's a point that you had made that public education about it. And especially, what can we do? Yeah, especially in Needham too, where we have such a high level of level of highly educated people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and especially in healthcare and stuff. They're gonna pick right up on that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the ratio is that we may need to adapt as a town as well as as residents. As a result of the new peer regulations, would also be useful to learn. Yeah, great. Okay, so I'll prepare some stuff for the next week. Yeah. In terms of COVID, there's a new variant that's awesome. beginning to, yeah, yeah what is it, the case on a case series oh. or something? Oh, is it exceeding yeah, flirt that one? Uh, maybe that's it. I forget. And they're I, getting I, them all sorts of things. exactly, but I knew I know there are new ones which are now accounting for about twenty five percent of cases. So we should keep an eye. I don't know if they're still testing wastewater or what have you, um, but we could see a late summer spike, is what mm -hmm. people are talking about. So they've seen an early Noon Wellesley Hospital seen an early summer spike already too. They've had more than they've had um, in the past four months. Yeah. There, so oh, so the case point point three variant. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, knew, I knew it was the case series. I was like, oh, it was like blur, and I was like, I didn't hear about the case point three, so I didn't know that either. Well, it came up 17 hours ago on NBC News. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, no, actually, I heard about that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> but yeah, maybe it's sitting in the news instead of the academic journals. <laughs> okay, all right, very good. Any other questions for Julie? All right, um, let's move on to substance abuse. Which one, which one, came, which, one came, which one did everybody put in first here? I think it was Carol was first, right? I think Carol and Lydia, but I think Lydia's given the first two. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll give a little update and we have our intern Natasha on too, and she'd like to talk about the work that she's doing after. So I'll just quickly share that Similar to last spring, if you recall, we were able to get approval from our funder to um, work with Screen Vision Media to show another PSA at the movies, um, Showcase Cinema, Legacy Place, and Patriot's Place. Um, it's the same campaign from Stamps of the Talk They Hear You campaign, encouraging parents, caregivers, and other adults to have conversations with youth about the risks of alcohol and other drugs. So we had a 90 second PSA put together. Um, it just aired for four weeks. It just finished this past Sunday. We sent the PSA to, I, yeah, yep. we, if there's time, we could show it. I don't know. I know sure. there may have been some screen yeah, sharing so issues. Yeah, hold on, wait. Oh.
Very good. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we've been promoting the campaign for a while. That's kind of the campaign overview of all the tools and everything as they continue to share their resources on social media and in print materials. Um, so we thought the timing was relevant, like end of the school year, prom graduation season. We they always tell us what movies are coming out, if it's gonna be a big week at the movies. And the this video was in um, the local ad or like the pre-ad package. So they run local advertisements before the big movie previews. And it runs, they sold us two to three times before every movie on every screen in both cinemas. So I requested um, the numbers from them now that it's finished and I'll probably have that for our next meeting of how many admissions tickets were sold. Um, any questions about that before I go to the next? <laughs> I just wanted to say that SAMHSA through the national campaign has been really helpful. We've used them to do um, editing of a postcard and it is a great resource. Um, they're happy that local communities can use these resources. And this particular compilation on the PSA talks about the screening tool parents or any adults can use to identify youth they may be concerned about uh, with mental health or substance, and then points them to the resources. So that's Screen for Success, um, myriad uh, supports for conversations, next steps, they have a mobile app. It's a really comprehensive upstream campaign to empower any adult to understand that they can have these conversations um, with adults as the biggest protective factor to navigate youth away from use. So plugging into this campaign and the resources and having them be able to edit, use their graphics has been great. And our, our other towns are appreciative and able to use this too. So our big goal is to make sure people know that they don't have to be concerned. They can start to talk. Um, I don't know if Lydia mentioned this video is on our YouTube channel and our goal right now is to build capacity across the four towns to get people, whether you're professional or personal, uh, to like and follow our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and um, that will build the exposure and then enable Meta Facebook to give us demographic information on reach once we uh, hit 100 followers and likers. So we have mandated reporting to BSAS four times a year and they're about data. So if you are inclined uh, and can look at our Instagram, Prevention Partners, Mass Call 3, and our Facebook page, uh, please consider liking or following us to build our, our reach. So thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'll go quick so we can get to Natasha's update. Natasha, some of you know she's been working with us since October on a youth engagement project aligned with one of our strategies and our strategic plan, which is um, a positive community norms campaign to shift norms away from high-risk behaviors and identify healthy behaviors that already exist in our town to grow them. So I'll let her share the project update. She's been working really well. Thanks, Lydia. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, we've been working on this project in all four towns, Needham, Dedham, Westwood, and Walpool. So um, in May, we were able to go outside or inside of each of the high schools and engage with youth by asking them, like, what motivates you or like, what is your reason to stay healthy and substance free in town? And we had all of the students that were participating write down their answers on a little um plaque that Lydia made that is like a little word bubble and then they got to take a picture with their answer and we're now putting that oh sorry I don't know why zoom does that <laughs> but um does the um we're now putting all their um answers into a video that I'm just finalizing so we're gonna make one video that has students from across all four towns and then we're gonna um, cut the video and have four separate videos that we're going to give to each town and the video has um, 
like the logos of all of the coalitions in town to share that information. And it was really great. We got to, our goal was to engage with at least 30 students in each of the towns. And we got to um, talk to over 120 students. So that was really awesome. Um, and the video is almost done and we're about to share it. So it was really awesome. I think that, that me, Carol and Lydia are all really proud of the project and we're really excited to share it soon. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions on this segment? And okay. I'll just say we're ending our fiscal year and our uh, grant allocation of $250,000 for FY24 is pretty much going to be spent down to zero. And our FY25 funding, as you know, is contracted with BSAS for $250,000 um, again. And then we'll hear more on what they're offering. So we appreciate your support and Tim and Tiffany's support as we did line item amendments and budget change. Um, but thank you. And I appreciate the board and Natasha and Lydia. Thank you. All right, Karen. Good morning. Um, so from a uh, Needham span perspective on substance use prevention, last month we had our um, parent education event. We held it at Pollard Middle School and it was geared for parents of, of any age, but we marketed it to um, parents with fifth through 10th graders. So we had 53 people in attendance for a presentation by pediatrician, Dr. Safdar Medina. And the goal of his presentation was to provide parents with education about substances. We are gonna be sharing that slide deck um, out to everybody who registered. And um, just hearing today, the conversation about public education, that was, one of the things that we set out to accomplish by giving parents education about substances, we did have a, he did include a, a brief mention about Delta AIDS and um, synthetic products like that. Um, there's such a broad landscape. I, I think it was a lot of information for people, but um, the good news is we could send them away with those, um, that information. And then we also had a panel of our principal of the Pollard Middle School, Tamitha Bibbo, our director of youth and family services, Sarah Shine, and we had a salsa leader um, from Needham High School come and in creating this panel, be able to provide parents with conversational tips for how then they can take this information and talk with their child. So really kind of aligned with the work that our Mass Call Free grant is working on as well reiterating the um, the importance of talking with your child, talking early, getting getting to children age appropriately um, earlier than high school, certainly. So I, I can tell you just roughly, um, most of the people in the room had middle school age children. So that was um, good to see that we were accomplishing getting that um, particular audience. Um, from a data standpoint, in addition to the Metro West data, we um, closed out our parent survey, which we host every two years. So we will have a report on that forthcoming, but that survey helps inform us for parents who have children in sixth through 12th grade about uh, similar perspectives aligned with the, the substance use data in the Metro West survey, their thoughts, beliefs, and perceptions around youth substance use in, in the town of Needham. So we're looking forward to having that as well as the Metro West to work together on. And then just briefly, um, we started year four, our fourth and final year of the Stop Act grant last month. And um, with that, we conducted, uh, we assisted the police department in conducting a compliance check on May 15th. And I have to report for the first time since we resumed the compliance checks with the police um, in we resumed those in December of 21. This was the first time we had zero sales to minor violations. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we have a report, we have a chart here at the end of my, my uh, monthly report that you can take a look at that. 
So that that was obviously excellent news, but um, we by no means are going to rest on our laurels with that. The compliance checks will continue, but it was just nice to be able to see zero violations. Um, and while this is a advancement of my monthly, we, we followed up this month with a tip stream, which I'll talk about next month at, at this meeting. So those are really the, the highlights. We we did also um, continue teaching mental health first aid in the community. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to be part of that initiative to further the education around youth mental health first aid to adults. Thank you, Mike. That's just a concern. No, I just, I, my only comment about the alcohol piece is I think the, you know, we know that when you're really trying to get to zero, training is necessary but not sufficient. And I think that the scanners and other technologies that have augmented that, hopefully, have really made a difference. Right. And we track as the, um, the check is conducted, we track um, when the operative comes out of the establishment, whether or not the, the scanner was used. So that's helpful information for us to be able to kind of watch the trends yeah. as it relates to sales to minor violations. That would be interesting to um, <clears throat> see that data as well. We can be working on that. Julie's been helping us with um, the spreadsheet for tracking that. So we can probably at the point where we have a trend to fail to see. Yeah. Right. The report that Boris and actually took action against one of the establishments that failed last time suspended their yes. uh, license for three days. Now they were not consecutive days, and you now so it might have been three Wednesdays. You know who knows, but maybe word is getting out that they're going to start. Yeah. So good news. Okay, thank you. All right, environmental. Okay. Um... You want to start? Yeah, I can start off. Um, so our first update is that we're able to um, secure an intern for the summer through the Mass Department of Public Health. She's also online. Her name's Hannah. Um, she had started last week with us, um, and she's planning on helping us with um, the, the adoption and maintenance of our voluntary FDA resale standards. Um, maybe she could talk more about this. She's online, so she can introduce herself and okay. talk about what she's working on. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Tuajine. Um, as I said, I'm working with um, SI, the health department. Um, I'm in my last semester at my master's in public health um, and healthcare management at UMass Lowell. And yeah, so this summer we're working on like the FDA food regulations, um, specifically food code eight. So that's all about like staff equipment and budget. So right now we're just trying to get everything in order and see if we like comply with standard eight. So I've been like, um, trying to track like the equipment the department has and like this um like when it comes to staffing levels and stuff and like how many like full like full-time staff is there doing like inspections um so this is my second week so I'm still learning everything but I'm excited to continue learning and I'm from Waltham so like I'm pretty close to them so I'm like interested in learning more about like a community so close to me yeah um she'll be assisting with the farmers farmers market inspections and like has the opportunity to shadow me as well as any of the other staff and our department so, very nice yeah well yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah i'll jump in just quickly um so we Sai and i uh, recently completed the mass fit food training program which is pretty rigorous it's a 24-hour training program which they're requiring all inspectors and um uh you know supervisors to take this um Fit program. So basically, Pamela Ross Kung had taught this course, which was, you know, again, she's on our staff. So um, she's definitely the, the guru of food safety and compliance. So she um, helped lead this class. We also had guest speakers attend uh, the virtual sessions. We had Cheryl Sabara do a session. We had Steve Natras do a session from FDA. We had um, some local um, um retired directors also do some inspections. So it was it was well attended as far as um, um, what we did. And then the the the, cap, the caveat was on on the last class was the in-person class and it was a Worcester State, um, which was the six hour class. So that topped it off and we were able to complete that um, and get a certificate as a result, um, which you had to do 80 or above to get that. So, um, so it was very informative. Um, I don't know if we want to talk quickly about Anything else here? Yeah, so, on the food safety? yeah. So I want to talk more about the food safety excellence program and our food code enforcement policy, which is like basically one document. Um, we've been piloting that since um, November, and um, and then um, which meaning like we've added a score to our inspection reports, 
Um, and what I've done is taken all like the scores and then um, if you've done like 114 inspections that are risk level two or above, and I kind of admitted the schools because the schools are, I wouldn't, I shouldn't be involved as far as I thought. Um, so I included a table that kind of describes like the, we, we used to use a, a scoring system of 752, meaning like we'll start with a score of 100 and then it would drop by seven if there's a priority violation. Um, drop by five, it was a priority foundation violation, and two, if there's a core violation. We found this to be really harsh because the average score ended up being a, uh, below a 70. Um, and uh, fewer than 15% um, uh, of the of the restaurants were getting a certificate of excellence or 90 above. So we found that that, that scoring system, that scoring, um, that weighting system was not working. So we um, are suggesting to change it to a five, two, one, um, deduction program. We found that to be um, more reasonable where this uh, the average was an 83 out of 100 and about a third of the restaurants were getting a certificate of excellence. So it was more feasible for them to get it. Um, but it was still stringent enough where, not, where every single restaurant was not getting a certificate of excellence. Um, obviously the whole purpose of this regulation or this policy is to um, make uh, our lives easier when we go and do our inspections that like there's fewer risk factors present um, that they're taking being more proactive with managing the kitchens and uh, we're not spending hours at a time doing these inspections and setting violations going back to three inspections so we're hoping that this kind of scoring system will this scoring problem program will actually achieve that um, so what we've also done is drafted a survey and and our uh, economic development town economic development um, manager has um, sent this out to 45 um, randomly selected restaurants to try to get feedback about this program because we want to get their input and incorporate their comments into our policy. It's been a struggle to get those responses from them. It's, it was sent out in, um, in mid-May and we have gotten a handful of responses. I'm also um, organizing and hosting open virtual sessions with um, sending a mass email to all the restaurants to try to get um, input from them because we find that to be, we want that we want, we want that input from them so we could incorporate that into our policy if there's any comments that they have um and we would like to at the end of the day is to uh take all that input um change our policy and propose it to the, the board in july's meeting basically yeah and then the rollout obviously we're, we're still looking to do a staggered rollout so it wouldn't go live until mid-july this is the scoring part of it and then we would initiate the finding process and pilot that for three months, but we're going to do this in stages is our proposal. And then we'll see how it goes live. And that's when the inspection reports, the, the summary sheets will be posted online. Hopefully we'll see, we'll start initiating the certificate program. If we get places that get 90 or above, that will be incentive to, to be more proactive with their inspection. Um, piece, so. And they can post that visibly in their... Mm -hmm. So on the people, front window, yeah. If people are aware of the pro, made aware of the program, <laughs> they'll know to look for those. Correct. Schools. Yeah, and we can work with Amy too, as a public information officer, and letting her know that time frame. That's our goal for the rollout at the start of it too. So. So then every restaurant right, is going to be very, very, very hard to get score up there. So we hope. So. Or she doesn't lose business. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And just quickly, the feedback session we ran yesterday, a lot of the retail stores came to that one. And so we've been going back and forth about whether we include the grocery stores because they're very detailed as far as they have five different departments. They're actually at a disadvantage because are they going to be able to earn that certificate? So actually, it was Roach Brothers yesterday who suggested, well, we we can be exempt from it, but maybe let the public know that we're exempt from it when just not getting the certificates, right? Because they're too varied. I mean, you don't have you don't almost have to break up each department and grade them separately for it to be fair. Oh, I see. You know what I mean. And the same with the schools. I mean, we were saying maybe they should be exempt, but we'll let the public know that these facilities that just don't they're not restaurants. We're not, particularly. Yeah, we're not scoring. Right, and get that education out there. And Rotros was happy with that. So we're just going to make note that we had forty minutes allocated for oh. all of the reports, and we have used thirty five minutes of that time. And we still have four reports to go. Mm -hmm. well, I'm at zero, but I'm just going to let you know. I understand we were early. We have a little bit of extra time, but you know, that's right. That's that's my that's my that's my job as timekeeper here, right? Okay.
All right, any questions? We're good. We can stop. Yeah, I think we're also planning on posting all the, the inspection reports on our website. So I think Julie will help with that once it goes live. And then we'll also keep a, a rolling list of all the restaurants that do achieve that 90 year above our certificate of excellence. And they'll be updated frequently as well. So they'll be on our website as well. I had two questions in your report. One, just salads reported not being helped when actively choking. People not trained in this and you know weren't offered, but was it just a matter of somebody wasn't offered water or was there actually a real medical issue here? Um, I don't think it was a real medical issue. Um, uh, I think it was just like a general complaint. Um, the person uh, said they had consumed um, some bread or something in the salad and didn't know it was present and they started choking on it. And then we're just complaining there's no like free water is available. So um, I followed up with the restaurant and they had some staff turnover, I guess, in the, within the first month of them opening. Um, so the the folks that were originally trained in choke saving procedures were no longer working there. So I made sure that they, the new staff got trained in that response to that immediately after that. So, okay. and the other was the dumpster at Temple Beth Shalom. You wrote note that it's they've been a chronic offender. So what are we doing about a chronic offender? So again, we're working with facilities over there, and you know it's almost been one of these they they would get on them about it, then they would do better for like a week or two or three, and then we get a complaint. So. We, I think our last correspondence with them, okay, well, this is repeating. So administrative meeting would be the next step if we keep getting complaints. And and what is, so they don't, they check it, but it's, I don't know if it's a problem with the, the so, facility. Yeah, so they have like catering events quite, or yeah, just like uh, which, which on the weekends and um, they don't, uh, the outside caterers produce a lot of waste and then they, uh, on like Sunday, uh, on Monday mornings, obviously after a Sunday event or something, there's a bunch of trash that's overflowing in the dumpsters. Um, and then the facilities guys are waiting for like it to get picked up. Sometimes it, the callers are late and there's a lot of factors involved. Based. Um, so uh, we've thought about potentially like uh, issuing order letters and, and fines and stuff like that. But we found that just um, communicating it with them to have it cleaned up that day, it gets done immediately. But it, it's been lots of... Cool some staff hour to keep on reminding them to do this. So we, we might start to uh, do more enforcement on that later on. Okay, very good. I had two quick questions as well. One is on the choking piece, because I was interested in that item as well, but what is the, the requirement around ch training staff and around choking hazards, et cetera? So any restaurants that have um, over 25 um, seats, including outdoor seating, um, <laughs> and what the restaurant is also allowing uh, in, uh, seating to happen. So if they're just doing takeout only, they don't have to have someone on premises that is trained in choke saving procedures. So um, there should be at least one person while the store is open and has in, has seating available and you can consume the food on site, be trained in choke saving procedures. And is that like annual training or just trained? Once it's so I think it's like a, almost like a, most people take like CPR classes and <clears throat> I think they're valid for like two years. We require it at every annual permit renewal. They have to okay. upload the current cert of the staff that's on site. But this is what happens to have changeover, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we hear about it. Mm -hmm. But they did get new steps. And then the other question was around Fuji Steakhouse. Oh yes, um, we just said I, we decided not to talk about that due to limited time. So um, since you asked about it, um, I'm sorry, Steve. so on <laughs> so on the Friday before Memorial Day weekend, um, Sam um, from Shared Services um, was doing an inspection there and then found. Um, many um critical violations present um and there were um there were such that they couldn't be corrected on site so um she had um made a professional judgment call to um to convince them to voluntarily close because they were not able to um address those issues but the main issue was like their their walking fridge was not uh running as uh wasn't cold enough basically um so uh I think it was like uh, so that same the next day or something. Um, they had requested a reinspection because they said that everything was corrected. We went back for a reinspection to try to get them open before the long weekend, um, and those critical violations had not been corrected yet. So fully, so then they had to remain closed throughout the weekend, and then we had a another reinspection after the weekend, after the long weekend, and they had corrected everything at that point, and we had them um, we issued them a an order letter. Uh, of sorts to um, hire a consultant and work with them to uh, on these like many, many um, food safety violations that they had. Yeah, it's how did it get to that point, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the same owner, Sean was there. 
and really what happened, you know, yeah. it's, these are the things. So again, what we're seeing it, it be a lot of a staffing issue. A lot of these ones that we're getting out of the, we're, we're getting more and more administrative meetings actually that are required to work with um, consultants and it's due to lack of staff, lack of trained staff, lack of staff that, that they, they come and they leave. This seems to be the common thread. And uh, I don't know if it's because of the shortage of stat workforce environment. So, but yeah, this, so this was another situation. So we require more sort of safe trained staff. They might have to hire more people to accommodate. So this is what we're working with a consultant on. Because mm -hmm. we were meeting, with, we basically <laughs> check in with the consultant on a weekly basis. So, thank you. I was gonna ask a question. I, you mentioned it in here and I've heard about it. Is, uh, have they finally resolved the rat issue down by uh, Farmhouse? Yeah, we were there yesterday. Okay. It looks really good, yeah. Good. So it, we they gassed the area twice. They did the two Saturdays consecutive. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any new holes or harborage areas there. We got on top of all the outdoor seating area protocols, had them resubmit those, reminded all the restaurants that they need to maintain those protocols because mm -hmm. this could happen. Um, and then that dumpster area as well, DPW, we met with, we met with Shane out at the site and he's going to have the doors fixed because what's happening is people are illegally dumping trash, which could also be contributing to that because the doors are wide open yeah. as they break. Uh, so Sean has a work order to fix that. But yeah, there's a lot of variables that just are involved. But right right now, yesterday, it was great. Yeah, I see the doors are broken sometimes there and also over uh, behind like um, the James or the James yeah, the was in Chapel Chapel mm -hmm. Street lot, and then that one's good too. Yeah. I want to jinx it, but yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, moving on. Um, shared services. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Here I am. Good morning. Hi, folks. Sorry. Um, I'm always a little slow on the draw to come off mute and make my camera work. Um, good morning. Um, I'm going to have three points for you and, and two uh, very much related to the environmental health report that you just heard. Um, the first is that um, the training that Tara and Sai just attended um, makes them eligible now for the last step of the required food inspector trainings that um, are being delivered by um, state funding and by shared services. So they're eligible and they will be um, trained by Sam Menard, who is almost, um, it, it's just at the very end, it's a, it's a rigorous training process to become a food inspector trainer in this new process. And Sam is uh, on track to complete that by the end of this month, and we'll start looking at scheduling trainings for folks like Sai and Tara starting in the new fiscal year. So that's um, exciting, and I think it will go some way towards addressing some of the things that um, Tara was mentioning about turnover. Um, hopefully, you know, we build a cadre of, of staff who all are trained in the same methods, it maybe will help pass along knowledge to the um, restaurants. Um, and then our la my last point is just that um, the intermunicipal agreement, which I know you're all really tired of hearing me say it's almost there, um, is still almost there. Unfortunately, we have um, we are just waiting for um, the town of Dover. There is a, um, a, a small issue about um, authority for hiring and firing that you're trying to clarify with that um town Con our needham town council is um confident that he is able to address it and i've been in touch with the technical assistance folks from um offered by the state from mass association of health boards and they're ready to intervene if need be but i think chris heap is thinks he's good so I really hope that the next time I talk to you all, I will be saying that the IMA is complete and signed, and I hope I'm not jinxing myself by saying that. Thanks. Okay. Questions for Harry or Sam? Nope. That's good. Nope. We have Allison for accreditation and Tala for emergency yeah. preparedness. So let's move on. Hi, everybody. I'll be um, doing the brief report out for accreditation. Um, 
We have uh, been making good strides on quality improvement. Uh, FAB requires a training for staff, and we did that on May 15th, um, focusing on some of the tools that they recommend. Um, as you might have heard, we've chosen the food safety excellence and alcohol compliance checks projects as our QI um, examples. And we heard about both of those in this meeting. We met with those staff um, and talked about some of the, the tools and worked through uh, one of them, the root causes of non-compliance um, with safety, food safety standards on, behalf, on uh, the part of the restaurants. Worked through some of the, the factors and such um, and um, kind of used that, um, the tools available to reframe and codify some of the good work that the teams have already been doing, um, just in a way that is um, aligned with FAB requirements. So that was a positive experience. Uh, Lynn has been working hard finalizing documents that um, she's been collecting to ensure that they meet FAB requirements. Um, and then in terms of performance monitoring, we have wrapped up the third quarter progress reporting. So that was January, February, March. Um, we, you know, met with all of the, the various teams and were able to uh, collect progress reports in the new um, VMSG performance monitoring platform. Um, and that went smoothly, wrapped that up in May, and we'll be um, doing a similar process for Q4 reporting uh, in July. Um, and we are in, um, in the process of doing fiscal year 25 planning now. Um, and uh, we look forward to, like I said, the Q Q4 reporting. So everything's moving, moving along, um, advancing well on the accreditation front. Thanks. Okay. Questions on accreditation? Mm -hmm. I think I'm all set. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would yeah. like to uh, to report one key item today, uh, which is. Uh, uh, we have completed uh, the required information for the special location, uh, critical structures, and uh, vulnerable population, and uh, we delivered them uh, to the consulting firm, who is the lead of this project, uh, and to our uh, emergency management administrator. The firm uh, uh, is going to edit this information uh, from, I mean, that this information along with other, like, uh, with other 13 uh, member communities, uh, which is including uh, NIDA, uh, into a uh, regional GI, uh, GIS database. Uh, also, uh, the firm will integrate all the information into a master database uh, for, the, for the county. Um, and then we'll share it uh, with us, with Needham, and, and we, we are going to share it with our GIS team. Uh, this info uh, will also be integrated into a computer-aided management of uh, emergency operation, uh, a cameo program, uh, to enhance our regional emergency planning and uh, mutual aid efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Kevin? No, thank you. That, uh, my question is how how often is, does that get re-updated um, once you've now done it this time? Yeah, uh, good question. So the last one, uh, the last time it was 2017, 2018. So uh, the uh, the firm pulled out the information from MIMA, uh, the state, and uh, he reached out to us and he said, "Okay, this database it's uh, out of date." And we need to do that. So I assume I, I assume like every like three to four years maybe. I am not sure, but I can get this information to you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, seeing none. Traveling meals. Not a thunder report. Uh, you can see volume is still very high. Uh, Rebecca is making progress on hiring her uh, seasonal drivers for the summer. And substitute drivers. Um, 
The big news is we've been granted a reprieve that by the, the hospital. Yes. I was going to say, no big news. Yeah, so we spoke with Denise at town meeting. Denise spoke with, um, uh, with uh, what's his name, John Fogarty at, at the hospital, who evidently had said, yeah, we, we're going to kind of work on that. And um, lo and behold, within a week, <laughs> you know, um, I think probably because there was mention that, you know, you just agreed to this as your pilot, you know, payment. I don't know. Maybe. 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 So, I think there were some political considerations. I think there were some political considerations, but uh, we've been granted a reprieve. Doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to work on getting the cap kitchen and everything else. Up and running, yeah. But, yeah. but uh, we've got that. All right. Um, if no questions there. All right. So we have a few more minutes. That's good. All right. Your CBD store update. Not a ton left on your CBD store. Um, it did close as, uh, or the products were removed as planned, but now it's officially closed. I believe. Yeah. Well, yeah. Soft thing as yeah. of yesterday. Yeah. Um, we had talked briefly about nicotine pre generation policy uh, last month. We have received hundreds mm -hmm. if i don't know oh, form letters yeah. yeah if i don't receive one yeah. every hour i wonder if you like the server phone or something on my email uh -huh. um and they get worse as the board meeting comes up uh -huh. <laughs> so we got like 20. i don't know if any of them are from people in need uh, yeah that's 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 yeah i've seen them up from connecticut you know yeah. so i don't know if this is just done by a bot I mean, I I mean, have the emails are weird surprised. yeah cover exactly emails are weird emails yeah. so probably yeah um so no real actual calls or questions or attempts to engage and discuss, just mm -hmm. form emails in response. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people in town realize that, you know, this issue has come, come before us. Um, you know, it's so hard to get information out these days, but that might be why we're not hearing from anybody in the neighborhood. We had a request from um, one of the high school students that's been interning with us one hour a week for the school year uh, to come and give a presentation because she worked on the 84. So she will come next month and give a presentation on what they're working with with the state house um, on nicotine pre generation. So we could try to get some information out to the community as well, just knowing that this is a top hot topic for. Well, I think nicotine pre generation is better than raising the age for purchasing to 25 or something like that. It's got that system. So is this something that, you know, ultimately we want to have a hearing? I think we have to get something you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah, get it going. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's the question. I wasn't sure, at least based on our previous discussions with the board, it's interested in doing it. Mm -hmm. that's, why I'm, that's why I'm asking right mm -hmm. now. Right now. Uh, well, let's face it, Brookline did it. Yeah. They did. I still am unclear on whether I think a, you know, it is politically unlikely that the age to engage in decisions like consuming alcohol or enrolling in the military or purchasing tobacco products will ever be 25, which is when yeah. you know that the risk Scientific processing centers of yeah. the brain are fully developed. There is some value certainly in delaying the ability to purchase a product like tobacco that is not safe to use and in any sort of law until those risk processing centers are developed. I just don't know if, and maybe it is, but if you are, say, 27 years old, and this is a product that is legal, should it be something you can purchase or should we limit it? I'm not sure where I fully stand on that idea that that person or that generation of people could be prohibited from doing something that other people who are also adults in that society can't do. Right. Uh, I have another thought, um, a different approach to this, and that is if, you know, if we're um, saying to the nicotine-free generation, we're we're banning this for you because it's bad for everyone, um, and, you know, because of the points that Tim just brought up, maybe we should think about retiring all of our tobacco permits, and we would just be a nicotine-free town. So actually, idea, Rob, sure that, that has been in progress now for the past decade. Yep. So we have not approved a new tobacco sales permit for the past 15 years. 
And yeah. as stores go out of business, we have not actually renewed them. We've been, just retired the permit and decreased the number available. Very well, well, since that, since low, I believe, down to five. Down. Something like that, yeah. We're, yeah, down, we're down to six, but when, yeah, and six, yeah. we've done pretty well, actually, because when I started on the board, there were 10. So it's when down. I started, there was 12. So. Yeah, so we've, we've been making slow and steady progress, which is you know basically what nicotine free generation would also do. So I think, I mean, that is another way to look at it too, right? Mm -hmm. Is that limiting slowly and gradually, um, you know, we don't have the ability to do other things that we know make it less enticing for young people, like raising the price through, you know, excise type tax. Mm -hmm. That's not something that's within the board's control originally. But there are options like, making it less available by having fewer outlets for sale. And there are already restrictions in terms of outlet density and outlet placements in our regulations, uh, in terms of like citing by school or something like that. Mm -hmm. What I find difficult is the implementation part. I mean, how we take, if we create a policy like this, how do we plan to implement it over the next five years, 10 years? I think that will become challenging for the board to manage. It's actually quite it's actually it. quite simple because there's yeah. simply a date. And you know, if the date of birth is, you know, after this date, then you know purchase. Oh, I mean enforce it. So what yeah. what I mean is that, you know, if there are violations, I mean, how do we keep count on the violations and then what do we do about those? So the violations wouldn't be on a person. So if a someone if a twenty two year old went to Newton and bought a uh, tobacco product and came back to Needham to use it, we wouldn't have the ability to um, enforce a violation against that person. It would just be against the retail establishments that are selling. So in, Needham, in, in, our in, Needham, in our town, in our town, they they could still go and buy from a different town. And, yes, they could. And how how do we you know? So when we, Needham went to Tobacco Twenty One, yeah. that was the same argument. You know, mm -hmm. the nineteen year old could go to Newton. Yeah. Get the tobacco and and use it and eat them. Some of them did, and some of them did, but other towns yeah. gradually adopted our policy. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's it was the okay. towns around need them generally, mm -hmm. and then around them, mm -hmm. and, and then, then it was the state, yeah. and then it was the state of Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then it was the nation. Okay, yeah. Brookline has started it. Mm -hmm. the question is, do we join them? And I think that's the most appealing argument for me is that mm -hmm. with this proceed in the same way as tobacco 21 and spread mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do think philosophically I'm still undecided on the question of if you are an adult if we have decided that at this age you can make you know your own choices about what is safe and what isn't safe within limits do we not allow the sale of this product yeah I mean we could do you know, it would obviously be more difficult and a lot more controversial but we could do a tobacco 99 policy right only send you know people who hit the century mark and buy tobacco mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think that makes a ton of sense, but that's another sort of prohibition that's not a full prohibition. Do we have um sort of uh more detail from Brookline about how it's going, what their experience is like, what sort of you know the community support has been, et cetera. Just curious. So we we can definitely get that. Um, I am friends with the Brookline Health Commissioner. She, uh, it was adopted by their town meeting as essentially a citizen's petition. Um, so the health department didn't necessarily ask for it. Uh, obviously it's their job to enforce it. And they were happy when the uh, court decision came down. Um, I don't know how the enforcement has gone yet, but we can find out about that. Say that be a route to follow instead of us doing it to go through town meeting or town meeting do it. You could. Well, you could, but I mean that's also the reason why we have hearings here. Yeah. 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 Get some public opinions. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, you know, talking to you know communities that have commissioners rather than boards of health, they, you know, are like, well, I don't know necessarily like the concept of a commissioner just, you know, adopting a regulation with the, you know wave of his or her pen. Mm -hmm. um, but Tobacco 21 never would have passed if it had been up to the select board. Never. It never would have passed if it had been up to town meeting, at least initially. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I think it got more popular with town meeting before it got popular with the finance committee and select board. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, it, it, I think part of what is appealing about the Mass General Law empowering boards of health to act as an agent of the state for the health of their community is that if the data is behind the decision, it's not up to a show of hands, right? Like right. The board who is empowered to act to protect the community can make a decision that is politically unpopular if it has good reason to believe this. And this board has always acted sort of following the evidence in the scientific and information. Sure we've always acted that way. Um, that's how we can There's nothing survive. but clear evidence in this in terms of the harms. Okay. That's true. Right. And that's, you know, when people say, you know, you haven't done it with alcohol, well, maybe that's next, but, you know, we'll, we'll start here. Uh, right. and, uh, I know prohibition did not did not work and ain't gonna, <laughs> but, you know, but this one, you know, this one could. Can make this bath, good. Alcohol this could, in your bathtub. This, so this like could it. do a lot of a lot of good in terms of preventing can you know preventing cancer deaths. Would this be something the board would want to yes. have a public hearing about in September? Would you want to have a further discussion about it in July? Well, it sounds like it sounds like we can, should continue to discuss it. We're going to have a presentation. It sounds yeah. like. Um, but what do people think about a hearing in the fall? Well, sometime Sometimes in the fall, yeah. I think it's a good yeah. idea. And, and people will be back in back town, let, too. Let people so know let's not do it in the middle about. of the summer. Yeah. 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 So maybe for the September meeting, we can put this on. Okay. I do think it would be nice to somehow, I don't think people, I know we have our colleague here, but I, I don't think people really know the story, at least I never did, of kind of the, um, uh, the smoking I need them, you know, start so that. 21. Yeah, tobacco twenty one, and I just I think that's yeah. a really important story that people should yeah. know. So if I don't you, know. you don't have a link to the New England Journal article that that really kind of outlines the whole story. Okay. Uh, you know, and I'm sure there are plenty of others. So we can get that and send it to the board just for its review. But we could work to also, you know, send we it out. Link it, link it on the, or link it on the website. That sort of thing. Yeah. I love it when you go to a meeting. Like, you know, Sir Cheryl and uh, the board at Nalvo, which is a national association. Yeah. And I went to one meeting. Somebody said, Oh, you're from Nina. You're famous. And I said, Why are you famous? <laughs> I said, Well, you're the first time in the United States to raise the age for, for 21 for tobacco. I said, Oh, yeah. I just don't think you need to know that. Yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. All that, <laughs> that, that all started right here. Yeah. That's before it was right before I got on the board that you were on the board. Yeah. You voted for that. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Stern. He yeah. It was Alan's last thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And boy, the select board was not happy. Oh, we had John Bullion sit on our meetings for about six or eight months. Mm -hmm. Every meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what we're looking forward to. Yeah, but we're not the we're not the first here. One would be second in Massachusetts, and this was you know at least discussed and you know very briefly implemented in uh, New Zealand before it yeah. was a change administration, and that's yeah. what kind of mixed it there. It wasn't a political consideration; it was a political consideration. Yeah. Right. All right. Do we have any other business today? No. Okay. Wow, we're done early. <laughs> Iron fist, right? I'll take, so I would take a motion to adjourn. Second. Oh, oh, one thing I guess I mentioned, maybe um, July is the only meeting you have scheduled now. Maybe we yes. discuss whether we want to continue with the schedule. At July meeting, we discuss whether we want to continue in September with the current schedule uh, so we can get those meetings booked. And if this is not the most conducive location, we'll look to find another location. Yeah, so... Yeah. Right. So traditionally, the board met very early in the morning at seven. Um, so it's not an interfere with the work day. Um, some people have child care commitments, which is one of the reasons we moved to nine. Um, I don't know where this board is right now, but we can certainly discuss that. Maybe we discuss that in July so that we can uh, start booking rooms. So it's something to think about. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Nick, you interrupted a motion. So. <laughs> okay, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> All right. Uh, any discussion? None. Good. Rob? Yes. Marty? None from me. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. And yes. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny. Make sure for the record.